G'day ZKD here, following up from my beginner's guide to Last Epoch, I'll now take you through the core endgame system, the Monolith of Fates. How it works, how to progress effectively, and how to get from it the gear that you want. The Monolith is the core endgame system of Last Epoch, so it's the focus of this particular guide, but do keep in mind that there are also multiple dungeons and the arena mode. The dungeons in particular play quite a large role in the endgame, I'll cover those separately in another guide. Also note that this guide is made as of 0.9, and there are planned improvements and additions to the endgame systems, as well as potentially additional endgame content. When there are some major updates, I may make some add-on guides. So when should you start endgame? Technically you can begin engaging in some of Last Epoch's endgame quite early on as you progress through the campaign. When you arrive at the end of time and unlock your mastery classes, you also gain access to the core endgame system, the Monolith of Fate. However, the lowest level monolith content is level 58. Probably quite deadly for your character at that point. If your character is really strong and overgeared, it can be a fun challenge to attempt the end game at low levels. And it is a way to power level later characters with powerful leveling items. But for the most part, I recommend at least getting all of your passives and idle slots unlocked through questing, which you can check the progress of in your overworld map screen. Finishing the campaign entirely and killing the final boss is not necessary to begin endgame, but there is a bonus plus one to all main stats, which is a nice little bonus and worth getting sooner rather than later. Some players opt to get all passives and idle slots, do some monolith to level and gear a bit, and then go back and finish the last few acts of the campaign, as those later acts can be quite challenging. So what is the monolith of fates? This is what you would consider the core of Last Epoch's endgame. It's progressive, randomized mapping system. The monolith is a collection of shattered timelines that are being consumed by the void. By exploring the timelines, you can stabilize them, if only for a little while. The monolith of fates is divided into different timelines floating in the void. Each timeline has its own unique flavor, questline, and final boss. Completing a timeline allows you to, amongst other things, unlock the branching paths leading to other higher level timelines. If you observe the number on the left of each timeline, you'll see that each has its own starting level. You don't need to be this level to access it, it just represents the minimum level of monsters that you'll face. Higher levels of course means tougher enemies and better potential loot. Completing the final three level 90 timelines and killing each of their final bosses will unlock empowered legendary timelines, where every monolith area becomes level 100 and the true endgame begins, but more on that later. Let's talk about Echoes. Within each timeline, there is a device that will allow you to travel to the Echoes of that timeline, the individual random maps. Each Echo has a quest objective, most commonly to find and kill a certain monster, mini-boss, or spire. If the objective is not already revealed on your map, then exploring the zone and killing monsters will reveal the location of the objective for you. Once the objective is complete, you can leave and claim your rewards and progress. There are other rarer objectives too, like defending against waves of monsters in an arena and some other unique echoes I'll come to later. Completing echoes gives the timeline stability, which you can see in the bar at the top. Selecting an echo will show you the minimum and maximum stability that it will give you on completion. Simply completing the objective gives the minimum, and you get bonus stability for killing monsters in the echo. Now a word on stability and monster killing strategy. In the normal monolith, I suggest you don't go out of your way trying to fill up the stability bar each echo. Simply focus on completing the objective and killing monsters in your way. The reason for this is that you will progress faster overall and get more rewards out of simply finishing an echo and moving on to the next one. This strategy can change as you get into high level empowered monolithing, but on your first run through I suggest sticking to the objectives. Each echo has several pieces of key information. The symbol on the echo itself shows the bonus reward type. What each symbol means is written in the echo rewards section when you select the echo. This is the extra reward you get when you complete the echo objective and portal back inside of that glowy crystal. You can get bonus XP, gold, crafting materials, guaranteed uniques or set items, and piles of specific item types. The other key piece of information is the new enemy modifiers. Each echo adds new modifiers to that and potentially subsequent echoes. These modifiers can make monsters tougher or deal more damage in various different ways. Some of these modifiers can really make things a lot harder, while others can be nearly zero impact depending on your build. 
so there can be some strategy in selecting the right ones as you progress. You can see how many echoes the modifier will last for as well. A duration of 2 means that it not only affects this echo, but also the next one. In high level timelines, these modifiers can last many echoes, like 6, and they can stack with each other. As you go from echo to echo, you'll potentially stack more new modifiers and old ones will periodically wear off. It's kind of a rolling map modifier system. In early timelines, the enemy modifiers can sometimes be easy to ignore. That said, it's a good idea to get in the habit of checking them, because in higher level timelines, bad modifiers can really stack up, and sometimes you may decide to avoid some as you progress. If you fail an echo by dying, the bonus reward and stability bonus is lost. You can still try again to complete that echo if you want to continue on that path, but those rewards will stay gone. If however you need to leave before completion, you can simply portal out. The echo will reset and you'll need to re-attempt it, but unlike dying, the rewards won't be lost. Now, how to progress a timeline. You begin at the crystal on this echo web for each timeline. You go from echo to echo, working your way outwards. The further you get away from the starting crystal, the more rewarding echoes become and the more interesting echoes that will start to appear. Important to note is that distance is not measured by the path you've taken, but rather by the direct distance from the start, so you don't really want to loop around and start coming back towards the crystal. Of course, if you see an echo reward you really want, or if you need to avoid some bad enemy modifiers, then it's perfectly fine to take a detour. As you get further out, stability per echo increases, so it's always a good idea to go as far out as you can, as quickly as you can, to progress your quests and beat the timeline. As you head further out, you'll start to notice unique echoes appearing, more so in higher level timelines. Beacon echoes reveal a chunk of the echoes around them, great for locating desired reward types. The rare Vessels of Chaos re-roll all echo rewards. If you've got a nice long path, this can potentially shuffle in some nice rewards for you to snatch up. And the very rare the Vessel of Memory uncompletes all echoes, allowing you to do them a second time, great for doubling up on good ones that you've already done. The most important echo, however, is the Echo of a World, also known as the Shade of Oribus fight. The Shade of Oribus is a unique mini-boss with many different variations of damage types and abilities, along with its own special unique item drops. The Shades are shadows of Oribus consuming reality, so the further out you go, the more you will keep bumping into them. Eventually, if you go far enough out, you will get fully surrounded and cut off by Shades of Oribus. Defeating the Shade of Oribus is very important for a couple of reasons beyond the uniques that it can drop. Killing one resets the timeline, putting you back at the crystal so you can begin anew. Your current enemy modifiers and stability are preserved, so early on, treat the Shades as a chance to reset when needed. Each time you do kill a Shade and reset the timeline, the corruption increases, making that timeline higher level, more challenging and more rewarding, but more on corruption later. Now Blessings are a very important extra layer of customization for your characters, and easily missed by new players. Each timeline has a set of Blessings that can give you damage, resistances, powerful utility stats like Leech, and even boosts to gold, XP, or loot drops. Each time you kill the final boss of a timeline, you will be presented with several options of Blessings. Pick the one most suited to your build. Killing the same boss again will allow you to pick a new Blessing or keep your old one. Initially, you're offered three choices. In Empowered Timelines, you're offered four, and then when you get to 200 Corruption, you're offered five. Empowered Timeline Blessings have higher magnitudes as well. Now, for your first time through, most builds will simply try each timeline once and hopefully score a useful blessing, maybe farming one key blessing if it's very important to the build, like, for example, Spell Damage Leech. For the most part, though, you should try to improve and perfect your blessings in empowered timelines for the best chances and possible power levels of each blessing. You can check your current blessings and blessing types for each timeline that you've seen in the past in the blessings menu of your inventory screen. If you want to see all the possible blessings for each timeline, then Last Epoch Tools has a page where you can browse them. Don't underestimate the power of blessings. It's possible to get up to 75% resistance blessings, for example, Getting one of these caps that resistance in one single blessing, which makes gearing a lot easier. Now the normal run through the Monolith of Fates timelines is basically a tutorial. Things really begin to get serious in level 100 empowered timelines. To unlock empowered timelines, you must beat all three level 90 timeline bosses, then run to this switch in between them. 
Activating it unlocks the empowered timelines. Now, whenever you go to a timeline crystal, you get the choice of normal or legendary, aka empowered difficulties. In empowered timelines, you no longer have to do the first two stability quests, simply fill up the bar to the third marker and go straight to the final boss fight. Overall, you'll notice right away that there's a decent increase in echo rewards, enemy modifiers, and challenge level. Echo reward types also become more interesting at level 100, giving a lot more options for exalted or set in unique items. And now we get to a very important mechanic, Corruption. While Corruption as a mechanic exists in regular timelines, it only really starts to become important in Empowered ones. Corruption starts at 100 in Empowered timelines, and killing Shades of Oribus that are far away from the Crystal increases Corruption. The further away, the more it increases per kill. Corruption increases monster damage and life, but also loot drops and XP gains. At higher Corruption levels, you'll also see more rare and valuable Echo reward types. And Corruption not only improves rare and unique drop rates from bosses, it also unlocks new possible drops from the Shade of Oribus itself. There are new unique drops unlocked for Oribus at 50, 120, and 200 Corruption. The 200 Corruption drop is particularly chase. Increasing Corruption is very impactful on both challenge and rewards, and it's your primary means of progressing endgame. There are several ways to ensure that you progress Corruption faster. Killing further away shades is the most important factor, as all other bonuses are affected by distance. So, try to get a decent distance away before fighting the shades. It can be easier to go diagonal to help avoid being cut off early. Killing timeline major bosses gives the Gaze of Oribus bonus that you can see in the top left. Each stack gives a chunk more corruption on your next shade kill. Failing a shade kill loses all Gaze of Oribus stacks though, so it's risky to stack it high if you're unsure of victory. Finally, there is the catch-up mechanic. Since corruption is specific to each timeline, this catch-up mechanic helps, well, catch up later timelines that you farm. The higher your corruption is in your highest corruption timeline, the bigger the bonus you will get to each Oribus kill until that new timeline catches up. For example, in Reign of Dragons, my corruption is 238. In Ending the Storm, where my Corruption is only 100, the furthest away Oribus kill gives a whopping 77 bonus Corruption. It'll actually only take me one kill here to go all the way to 200 Corruption. What do you do with this infire? Well, it means that if your main goal is currently to increase your Corruption, it's a good idea to stack it nice and high in one timeline so you can use the catch-up mechanic to quickly progress the others later. It's a good idea to pick a timeline that has a particular blessing or drop that you're trying to farm at the same time. On that note, let's talk about target farming uniques. There are a couple types of unique item target farming options that you can take advantage of in the monolith. The first is boss specific uniques. Each of the final timeline bosses has a set of uniques. Many of these are excellent and many build defining. These uniques can only drop from these bosses, so often an endgame goal is to target one or several of these boss-specific uniques. If you want to see what uniques each boss has, Last Epoch Tools has a list of timelines page that I'll link in the description. You can select a timeline and see all the uniques that can drop from it. The uniques themselves have three different categories with their own unlock criteria. The most common and unlocked straight away are the common category. Each boss has two of these and it's 50-50 which ones drop. All of these are effectively very easy to farm, as you generally only need one or a couple of attempts to get the one that you want. A great example of this is Woven Flesh from the Fall of Outcasts, literally the first timeline. It's a great chest for almost any build that, as it has life, leech, and a full critical strike avoidance mod, making you immune to crits. A great starter item for any build. The next category of timeline boss uniques is the rare drops. These drop, as the name suggests, quite infrequently, depending on the unique item. It took me 12 attempts, for example, to get my Twisted Heart from the Reign of Dragons, though it can certainly be worth it for the power level of some of these items. The final category is the rare, empowered only uniques. Each boss has one or more rare drop uniques that only unlock in empowered monoliths. That said, you should only really attempt to farm either normal or empowered only rare uniques in empowered monoliths in my opinion. This is because their drop rate is boosted by item rarity, which is boosted by corruption and enemy modifiers. So if you want to get that chase rare drop, push that corruption up. I mentioned earlier that the Shade of Oribus also cares about corruption. Don't forget that it, its uniques unlock at 0, 50, 120, and 200 corruption specifically. 
Shades Rarer drops also scale with that corruption, so push that corruption up if you want that very rare ominous drop. For all other, non-boss specific uniques, you can use the monolith to target farm them on an item type basis. Each monolith has a certain bonus echo reward type that it contains. Ending the Storm, for example, has unique or set gloves echo reward type as a bonus. So if you want a specific set of unique gloves, farming that timeline is the best option. This only matters in empowered monoliths, so get there first before beginning to target farm like this. The full list of reward types for each timeline is on Last Epoch Tools, as well as listed on the difficulty screen for each mono. Also keep in mind that the rarer reward types, like guaranteed uniques, occur more often further out from the start crystal and at higher corruption values. Now if you're looking to stock up on stash tabs or run the Lightless Arbor dungeon that's very gold hungry, then I'll give you some quick tips for gold gain. Firstly, it's not worth selling most items, even uniques only net 500 gold, so save your time there. The exception however is Arena Keys. Normal ones sell for 6500 and memory keys for 7250 gold, so you can offload your extra to vendors for a worthwhile amount. Otherwise, gold reward type echoes are your best bet. Gold shrines are great too, but there's no way to actually target farm those that I'm aware of. Do note that you can get up to 70% increased gold drop from a blessing in the fall of outcasts. You'll also get more gold from monoliths the higher your corruption too, so as always, push up that corruption. Finally, for your exalted items, look for the right reward types on echoes, keeping in mind that you'll see more of these as you push corruption and push out further from the starting crystal. Keep in mind that tier 7 exalted affixes, the best ones, only start dropping in level 90 plus content. So if you're trying to craft some big items, you at least want to be doing those level 90 timelines, but preferably empowered monoliths. As always, push up that corruption. And that just about covers it for the Monolith of Fates. If you have any questions or if you think I missed anything, then let me know in the comments below. That's it for now, I'm Ziggy D, and thanks for watching.